an all-American woman. She was a beautiful young gal, and she had a great personality. She was amazing. She was so kind and so caring. She was my sister. She was my everything. Is found murdered in her bedroom. She had been strangled quite violently. Whoever the killer was crushed the victim's neck. Police hunt for the culprit. I had in my mind who committed the crime. We were convinced that he was our guy. But the prime suspect slips from their grasp. I don't get it. Did he really get away with it? Decades later, leaps in forensic science reignite the investigation. We're not giving up on the case. Is there a smoking gun? We got to find it. I figured that if this case could be solved, it could be solved now. And new evidence leads to a killer no one saw coming. It was shocking. It was unexpected. And guess what? We have a new suspect. I was stunned. I was like, really? In the early morning hours of June 6th, 1980, the peaceful suburb of Woods Cross, Utah, is shaken by a frantic 911 call. Butch Cross had never had a uh, homicide. This was the first one, and it definitely was not something we were used to. Police respond to the modest home on the outskirts of Salt Lake City. Well, I got called to respond to this house that they'd said there had been a homicide. So I went into the bedroom area where the victim was, laying on the floor, kind of laying up against the bed. She appeared that she was in her sleeping clothes, just a little T-shirt and a pair of panties. First thing that I noticed, she had bruising and scratches on her neck area that looked like she had been strangled and been strangled quite violently, in fact. I believe that she had put up quite a struggle and quite a fight. Horn fingernails and some bruising on her legs and her feet. It was an indication she fought pretty hard. It looked like she had been knocked off of the bed and onto the floor. Two or three of the rungs in the bed that had been broken out. So it was obvious that there was a pretty good uh, struggle had taken place there. Police searched the rest of the house looking for clues to what happened. And looking around, I didn't believe that there could have been a robbery or anything of that nature because everything else was in place. It did not look like a robbery or theft. This looked more like a, a personal attack. This looked more like that she was the target of her killer. Investigators turned to Steve Strom, the man who had called 911. He tells police the victim is his wife, 25-year-old Karen Strom. Talking to Steve, he was kind of hysterical, just very upset that his wife was dead. Steve worked at a uh, manufacturing plant on the graveyard shift. He said everything was fine when he left the house the night before to go to work. He worked the night shift till about 7 in the morning. And when he got home, he walked into the bedroom and saw his wife. While investigators continue their hunt for clues, police inform Karen's family of the tragic news. I was at work at the phone company. My stepmother called me and said, your sister's dead. I said, what? What happened? She goes, we don't know yet. That was heart-wrenching. I wanted to know what happened to my sister. Karen Saltzgiver was born in Bountiful, Utah in 1954, the oldest of three children. Karen and I were five years apart. My parents divorced when we were younger, and that's always rough on kids. It was a struggle. But Karen was always there, playing mom, and I think it was just her nurturing instinct she was amazing. She was strong. In 1973, Karen married Steve Strom right out of high school at the age of 18. Karen and Steve were high school sweethearts. Karen was very outgoing, very fun, very loving, and Steve was very quiet. She saw something in him. They used to go four-wheel driving a lot and up in the mountains a lot. It was a sense of freedom for her, and Karen loved nature. Over the next seven years, the young couple worked hard to build a life of their own. Steve worked at a machine shop. Karen worked in accounting for the state of uh, Utah. And they had an apartment in North Salt Lake, and then they bought a house in Woods Cross. It was a family-oriented place, and it was a new development. 
She was so excited because she got a house and a good job. You know, she had her Camaro and yellow. Yellow was her favorite color. It seemed like her life was on the right path. Karen's seemingly perfect marriage had a troubling hidden side. Steve liked to drink. And I think that's what caused a lot of the problems in their marriage. When Steve wasn't drinking, he was very quiet. But when he drank, yeah, there was a whole other side of him that came out. He was mean. What I witnessed with Steve was a lot of screaming and yelling, and then he'd leave. Mostly um, what I witnessed with Steve and my sister was the aftermath. She had bruises, and Karen got good at hiding the bruises with makeup. But it's like, you can see them. You know, to me, I didn't understand. Karen defended Steve all the time. He's just going through a bad time. Things are rough. You know, he'll get over it. It's OK. But three months prior to Karen's murder, something changed between her and Steve. Karen finally had enough, told Steve she wanted a divorce. And I thought, yes, yes. I just wanted the best for her, because she wanted that for me. But before Karen can move on, her life is brutally cut short. My world had just fallen apart. My world was crushed. She was my everything. She was my sister, my protector. She was my best friend. As Coco struggles to come to grips with Karen's death, back at the crime scene, police continue their search for clues to who may have attacked Karen during the night. There was no indication that anybody had broke into the house. The next door neighbor said that she had heard nothing. Steve had calmed down by that time. He said that he had found the doors locked, and when he got home, used his key and went into the house. As Steve is being questioned, Coco arrives looking for answers. The police didn't give me any details on exactly what happened. They did say that she had been strangled. Then they brought her body out in a black bag, and oh, that just tore me up. It's like, that's my sister. Don't put her in there. Steve was sitting there, and I just looked at him like he finally did it. There was no doubt in my mind that Steve did it. When Coco got to the house there, the first thing she said, he did it. He finally did it. He killed her. Anytime you have an incident like this, always start with the husband. Coming up, detectives discover a tangle of relationships. Steve said that everything was going great with them. It was pretty obvious that it was not. Failing the polygraph was pretty damning. Before their hunt for a killer produces a jaw-dropping twist. An innocent person just wouldn't flee. We were worried if we came to the door, he was going to shoot us. And a new suspect with a dark past emerges. He raped a girl, and then he stabbed her with a screwdriver and left her for dead. Who is this guy, and how did he know my sister? Police in Woods Cross, Utah, are investigating the murder of 25-year-old Karen Strong. Her sister, Coco, has told police she suspects Karen's husband, Steve Strong, is the one that killed her. Coco had been really close with Karen, and they talked a lot. And she had expressed that Steve was a heavy drinker, and when he got drunk or he'd been drinking, he got mean, he got uh, abusive. Coco didn't like him at all. Detectives learn how Karen had decided to end things with Steve three months ago. She filed for divorce, and then she moved out to my stepmother's house. Coco says that Karen was only at the house the night she was killed because she felt sorry for Steve. It was his birthday and their anniversary. Steve had called her and said, can you come out and we'll just have dinner together? And she did, because of her kind heart. Coco believed that their relationship was over, although Karen agreed to come back and just kind of stay with him for a couple of days. Recently separated from Steve, Karen had a new suitor named Buff. Karen told me a little about Buff, that she met this guy that was really different, and. He treated her really kind, and I don't know if she thought it would go anywhere, but I know it meant the world to her. He showed her that she could be treated decent and that she deserved it. Coco said that Steve was also a very jealous person, and in her mind, she was sure that he had killed her. 
I said, how could it be anybody else? It was, you know, it was Steve. Detectives confront Steve Strom about Coco's allegations. He uh, consistently stated that uh, he had a good relationship with his wife and, and that there was no abuse. Steve felt that the only reason that uh, they were getting a divorce it was his drinking. He said that they had worked things out and that they were going to get back together and uh, she was not going to go through with the divorce. Investigators ask Steve to account for his movements leading up to when he last saw Karen alive. Steve said that he and Karen had gone out to dinner earlier that evening and then they'd come home and watch TV and then he got ready and left for work. If Steve is telling the truth, Karen was killed sometime after midnight when Steve left for work and before 7 a.m. when he returned home to find her body. Detectives ask if the doors were locked during that time, how did Karen's killer get into the house? Steve gave us the name of about four or five people that she might have opened the door for, but uh, had indicated probably the one that she would really open the door for after she went to bed would have been Buff. Steve admits that he knew Karen had been dating Buff while they were separated. Steve said that uh, the relationship with Karen and Buff was over and that they were getting back together and uh, you know, make another go of their marriage. With nothing concrete to hold him, detectives let Steve go. After police release Steve, the news that Karen was murdered spreads through Karen's family. It just broke everybody's heart. My mom, I mean, that was her oldest daughter. She couldn't deal with it. She just shut down and shut off. It was just heart-wrenching, and it was something that was so surreal. I was trying to wrap my head around, she's really gone? As Karen's loved ones reel from the murder, detectives head to the factory where her husband, Steve, works as a machinist to confirm his timeline and verify his story. I talked to the supervisor and got copies of his time card. And as far as anybody there could remember, he was on his machine the entire time. Despite confirming that Steve was at work when he said he was, investigators cannot dismiss their suspicion of him without a better idea of when Karen had been killed. That timeline was very important to the case because we'd be able to tell who had opportunity during that time. As detectives continue their investigation at Steve's workplace, one of Steve's co-workers they speak with is 29-year-old Ed Owens. Steve Strom had named Ed Owens as one of the individuals that Karen would have allowed in. Ed and Steve were uh, not only co-workers, but they had became friends. They socialized together, socialized with their spouses. Both of them liked to drink, and so they oftentimes did it together. There was an incident where Steve had ended up so intoxicated that Ed and Karen had to take Steve home and carry him into the house and put him to bed. Ed tells detectives that he was working the shift before Steve arrived that night, but had left the plant for his meal break around 8 p.m. Ed had said that he had left work and then gone to the local bar to eat, get uh, his lunch, and he started drinking with some friends till they closed the bar and then went out in the parking lot and continued drinking. Ed came back to the plant about 4.30 in the morning. He was obviously intoxicated. Steve had actually offered Ed a ride home, but Ed had refused and drove home intoxicated. As investigators talk to Ed, something about his appearance draws their attention. I did notice that he had some scratches on his arm and uh, close to his eye on the nose. Detectives question Ed about the scratches. Could he have been scratched while he attacked Karen? He explained those as he worked on the lathe and there was the shavings. He was always kind of getting uh, scratches or cuts on his thing. Talked to the supervisor at his work and he indicated that, uh, that that happens quite frequently. Just to be sure, detectives ask Ed's co-workers to confirm he was drinking with them the night of the murder. So I interviewed the people he was hanging out with and they all stated that he was there and he didn't have any motive as far as I could uh, determine. With Ed's alibi confirmed, investigators turn their attention to the other man in Karen's love life, her boyfriend, Buff. Did he have motive for murder? Steve Strom told the police they were reconciling. 
So then we have to begin to question Karen's termination of that relationship with Buff. If they were going to get back together, Buff would have been upset about that. His attitude might have been, if he couldn't have her, nobody else would. Less than a day after 25-year-old Karen Strom is found strangled to death, police in Woods Cross, Utah, have ruled out her husband's friend, Ed Owens, as the killer. There was no indication that Ed had been involved in the, uh, in the death of Karen. But despite verifying his alibi, detectives do keep Karen's estranged husband, Steve Strong, on the suspect list. Her sister, Coco, talked about how abusive he had been and that Karen needed to get out of that relationship. Now, investigators want to speak with the man Karen started dating shortly after separating from Steve. Buff Bangeter was a man uh, who Karen Strom had had some degree of a relationship with. And so, of course, law enforcement had reason to talk to Buff. Detectives begin the interview with the 35-year-old mechanic by informing him of Karen's murder. He seemed uh, upset when he found out that she, uh, she had been killed. Then, Buff stuns investigators by revealing just how serious his relationship with Karen had become. According to Buff, they had wanted to get married, and it was Buff that persuaded her to go back to see Steve to be sure that what she wanted to do was to get the divorce. Detectives ask Buff where he was on the night Karen was killed. Buff stated he was at home that whole evening, and he would not have harmed her in any way. And he also made the comments that he thought it was Steve. According to Buff, it was pretty obvious that he was uh, very angry about Buff's relationship with Karen. Even with no one to back up his alibi, police decide to let Buff go. We didn't eliminate him entirely, but after we interviewed and talked to Buff, we felt pretty confident that, that he was not the one who had committed that crime. I couldn't place anyone else having done the crime except for Steve. He remained my number one suspect. While they wait for crime lab analysis to be completed, detectives keep digging into the people Karen may have led into the house the night she was killed. I interviewed each of the individuals who Steve indicated that he thought she might let in, took uh, blood samples from each of them. I covered all the bases that I could. Investigators also received the forensics report from the crime scene. Crime lab went clear through the house and checking for fingerprints, and there was no fingerprints in the house that they could find other than Steve Strom and Karen. And that was pretty damaging as far as evidence towards Steve. Karen's autopsy results also come back and show no evidence of sexual assault, but do confirm strangulation as the cause of death. Whoever the killer was crushed the victim's neck. This was an aggressive, violent, vicious attack. Karen was scratching and clawing and fighting for her life. Karen's fingernails are clipped and preserved. As far as DNA back in 1980, there was not a lot more that they could do. The testing you could do with any sort of evidence is very limited. The autopsy also provides an idea of when Karen was killed. The approximate time of death was between 10 p.m. on the night of the 5th and 2 a.m. on the morning of the 6th. This means it was possible Karen was killed before Steve left to go to work. The time of death did not give Steve a strong alibi. By his own statement, it was after midnight when he went to work, so he was at home during that period of time. Armed with this new information, investigators reach out to get Steve in for another interview, and he makes a surprise request. Steve requested to take a polygraph. He said that he was innocent, he didn't kill his wife. Polygraphs are not admissible into court, but it would also have been a good tool to see if he was lying or not. We did a polygraph and asked him if he knew who killed his wife, if he killed his wife, and if she was dead when he went to work. According to the polygraph operator, on those particular questions, he was extremely negative as far as being truthful. 
Failing the polygraph was pretty damning uh, to Steve, and we were more and more convinced that Steve was involved in this murder. Detectives still need more evidence in order to charge Steve with Karen's murder. I interviewed some of the people she worked with. They had indicated that numerous times saw her with bruises when she came to work. At one time, that she had bruises on her neck and that she made a comment to them that Steve had choked her. She felt that she was lucky to be alive. The co-worker's account is the final evidence police need to charge Steve, and a warrant is issued for his arrest. We went to arrest him at work, but he was not there. One of the co-workers told us Steve was with a friend down in North Salt Lake in an apartment. They had indicated that he was worried that we were coming after him. He was possibly going to be violent and, and resist arrest. We were worried that if we came to the door, he was going to shoot us. Police proceed to the apartment address with caution and establish a safety perimeter around the building. We knew he had guns, that he might be violent. We were anticipating the possibility of it being a, a very uh, difficult arrest. Police investigating the murder of Karen Strong are preparing to arrest their main suspect, her estranged husband, Steve. He had been known to have a weapon. It was a 357 Magnum. We was told that Steve had also made a comment to one of his co-workers that if the police come to get him, he was going to take a couple of pigs with him. Having that information made us feel very uh, uh, nervous about approaching him. Police maintain their distance, fearful of a violent confrontation. There was a SWAT team that was uh, organized that had surrounded the apartment. After several phone calls into the apartment, Steve wasn't cooperative. Steve refuses to answer police phone calls. Three hours tick by without a resolution before Steve finally answers. Finally, he was convinced to come out peacefully. Two months after his wife was killed, Steve is finally arrested for Karen's murder. The news quickly spreads to her loved ones. The whole family, when they found out Steve was ar arrested, kind of breathed a sigh of relief. Good. You know, it was one step closer to being over. After two months of investigation, prosecutors believe they have enough evidence to convict Steve of killing his 25-year-old wife. There was significant pieces of evidence that pointed at Steve Strong circumstantially. It appeared that he had opportunity, didn't have a good alibi. He had motivation potentially jealousy. He had history of domestic violence, particularly when Steve would drink. You had the incident where the co-worker saw Karen uh, with strangulation marks on her neck, and Karen had told her it was Steve Strom that did it. So that was a significant uh, component to the case. Put all the pieces of the puzzle together, and it did look like they've got a reasonable likelihood of conviction. Steve is held on remand for six months as prosecutors prepare their case. But just before the trial is set to begin, Steve's defense attorney asked the judge to exclude the testimony from Karen's coworker about Steve strangling Karen. The defense said the coworker didn't actually see it. The coworker is only reporting what Karen told her in what's known as double hearsay. And the judge made an evidentiary ruling that disallowed prosecutors from using that evidence or information at trial. And that was kind of a shocker to me because that was one of our key pieces of evidence. The interviews where people had seen the bruises, she had told them who gave her the bruises. Unfortunately, all of that comes out to be hearsay evidence and uh, was not going to be admissible to court. Without an eyewitness to abuse, prosecutors have a hole in their case against Steve. Without that information, they don't have enough evidence to persuade a jury beyond a reasonable doubt that he killed Karen. And if they go forward and lose, Steve Strom, because of double jeopardy, could never be prosecuted again for Karen's murder. Prosecutors make the difficult decision to drop the charges and let Steve walk free. When I found out the charges wouldn't hold, my heart just sank. It was like, what? Why is this happening? Show me, show me why this is happening, because I don't, I can't wrap myself around this. 
I just didn't understand why they didn't have the evidence. Coco was very upset that we had released him, and so was I. But most of the evidence that we had against him was circumstantial evidence. We didn't have any hard evidence towards Steve. For the next four months, detectives continue digging, trying to find the evidence they need to close the case. I did a lot of running around during that time, interviewing people and trying to find more evidence. However, most of the stuff we were getting was still hearsay. By the time the one-year anniversary of Karen's murder comes, little hope remains. I felt that I had done everything that I could. My main thing at the time was making sure that I preserved all the evidence we had collected. So if something did come up later, we would be able to use it. In the summer of 1981, the hunt for Karen's killer goes cold. A year went by, another year went by, and I call anything, do you have anything new? Nothing, Coco, nothing, and it's like, did he really get away with it? The case remains cold for more than two decades, but police in Woods Cross never forget the murder of Karen Strong. I retired from in 2005. However, I have to admit that I was still upset about the fact that I could not tie Steve to the murder. In 2006, 26 years after the crime, new detectives take a fresh look. This case was a high profile case. And at one time, there had been a lull in the caseload. So I had asked if I could focus all my time on this case. Knowing that there was new developments in science, I figured that it was the right time to pick this up because if this case could be solved, it could be solved now. I uh, went through the evidence looking for specific items that could be tested. The items that we sent in to the lab for examination first were Karen's fingernails. Police in 1980 found material under Karen's fingernails, but had no way of testing it. Could this hold the key to identifying Karen's killer? We was quite worried that the evidence had degraded. I mean, it had been 26 years. The crime lab tests Karen's fingernails, searching for her attacker's DNA. When those results came back, it was a bombshell. There was DNA of Steve Strom underneath Karen's fingernails, but also there was unexpected DNA evidence underneath Karen Strom's fingernails. And guess what? We have a new suspect. Investigators who have reopened the cold case murder of Karen Strom have just received their first clue in more than 25 years. DNA from under Karen's fingernails has been traced to two different men, her husband, Steve Strong, and someone on the original investigator's radar. That DNA belonged to Ed Owens. The fact that Ed Owens' uh, DNA was underneath Karen Strong's fingernails, it was shocking. Ed Owens was Steve's friend and coworker. Ed's blood had been collected in 1980, when police first considered him a suspect. There was no recent contact between the two uh, that anyone was aware of. We got to dig a little bit deeper into Ed Owens as a realistic suspect. The presence of Ed and Steve's DNA is evidence to investigators the men had contact with Karen. But is it a sign that one or both had killed her? In search of answers, detectives tracked down the now 56-year-old Owens. Ed and his wife were currently living in Falls Church, Virginia. Initially, when uh, I was talking with Ed, he started asking me questions as far as who the suspect was and any new developments in the case. I was suspicious when talking to Ed because of uh, the questions that he was asking me. I wanted him to come into Woods Cross and meet with me and discuss this matter face to face. Ed Owens agrees to come back to speak with investigators the following week. Detectives also reach out to the now 53-year-old Steve Strong. Steve had moved to Henderson, Nevada. I contacted Steve 
and ask him if, if he would come up uh, from Henderson and meet with me and go over uh, his statement that he gave back in 1980. He wasn't at all that cooperative. He said that for years he's been telling the authorities that he didn't do it, and he believed that we was still after him. For prosecutors, Steve's DNA under Karen's fingernails does not, in fact, strengthen the case against him. It was not new to learn he was with Karen on the night that she had been murdered. We're now looking at this from what can the science show us? Who can we show did what based upon this evidence? So now we need to take the next level of testing and figure out what type of DNA are we talking about. Detectives resubmit the fingernail DNA for a more detailed analysis. And the forensics lab has another surprise in store for investigators. It was determined that Steve's sample was very minute and Ed's was the dominant sample. And the uh, substance uh, of Ed's was seminal fluid. I was a little shocked about that. Steve and Ed were, were close friends, but they, there was no relationship between him and, and Karen. Karen's autopsy had shown no evidence of sexual assault, so investigators are surprised by the indication of sexual activity. That was unexpected. Why is Ed Owens' seminal fluid underneath Karen Strom's fingernails? What happened here? Was this consensual sex that then went awry? Was it not consensual sex? Was this a forced sexual assault situation? In the 1980 investigation, Ed's alibi put him at a bar with friends when Karen was killed. I contacted the co-workers, uh, people that had been to the bar with Ed on the night of the homicide. Both of the witnesses was unable to say whether Ed was at the bar the whole time. The co-workers had also noticed the scratches on Ed's hands and face the day after Karen's murder. Ed was asked uh, how he obtained those injuries, and uh, he said that he was playing with his dog. Strikingly, that statement contradicts the one Ed gave to detectives 26 years prior. Ed had said that those scratches were obtained by working on a lathe machine. This was raising some red flags as far as Ed's involvement in this matter. Detectives are eager to talk to Ed themselves, but he fails to arrive for a scheduled interview. Ed just mysteriously turned up missing two days after he, he had spoken with me. Left a note for his wife. It was a goodbye note. Well, after hearing this, I uh, subpoenaed some banking records of Ed's, and through those records, we determined that he crossed the border into Mexico. An innocent person just wouldn't up and leave his family and, and flee. Detectives get another surprise when they dig deeper into Ed's background. Back in 1980, the investigators ran a background check on Ed Owens in Utah. I, however, ran uh, the national database on Ed Owens and found that Ed had been arrested in California in 1973 and charged with attempted murder. A man raped a girl on the beach, strangled her, and then he stabbed her with a screwdriver and left her for dead. Ed Owens is charged and arrested, did go to trial, but Ed Owens' mother gave him an alibi. So the jury did not convict Ed Owens. Even though Ed hadn't been convicted, pieces of the puzzle just start to fall into place. We believe Ed's the killer. An arrest warrant is issued for Ed Owens for the murder of Karen Strong. When Sergeant Benson called me and said, Coco, are you sitting down? He goes, do you know who Ed Owens is? I said, I've never heard of him. And he said, Coco, that's who killed your sister. I was shocked. All these years thinking of Steve, I was stunned. I was like, really? It was like starting all over again from scratch. Who's Ed Owens and how did he know my sister? It was kind of a shocker to me because I was totally convinced that it was Steve. With Ed Owens in Mexico, investigators strategize how to get him back to face justice. I made contact with Ed's mother, advised her that I had a warrant of arrest for him, 
and that he could either come in voluntarily to meet with me or uh, his picture would be on the 5 o'clock news. And then interestingly enough, Ed Owens then shows up. He came back to Utah, came walking in the door. I was surprised that Ed actually showed up to the office. I believe that he was uh, trying to put on this persona for his family of what type of a person he was. At that time, I took him to an interview room and attempted to get a statement from Ed. However, he lawyered up and didn't want to make a statement. On March 14, 2007, after two and a half decades, Ed Owens is arrested and charged with the murder of Karen Strong. Our case is looking pretty good to us at this point in time. We've got science now backing us up. We've decimated his alibi. We've got the evidence of flight. So a lot of things were stacking up in favor of a conviction. But then, three weeks before the trial, prosecutors are thrown another curveball when they learn of Ed's defense. The defense's contention was going to be that Karen was having an affair with Ed. Steve became jealous and enraged about it. Steve went home and killed her. The defense attorney was claiming that seminal fluid of Ed's only shows that he had had an affair with Karen, not that he'd actually killed her. It's a jolt. We were kind of blown away. Ed had never, ever come forward with that story before. This was something new, so it opened up a new can of worms. Prosecutors know this defense could be enough to raise reasonable doubt to a jury, especially since Steve had originally been charged with Karen's murder. But how could they disprove the defense's claims? Is there a smoking gun with this case? We got to find it. We now need to regroup. So again, like they did back in 1980, um, we dismissed the case without prejudice as we're getting close to trial. That was not an easy decision to make, but we knew it was the right thing to do. We were confident we had the right guy. But at that point in time, we weren't confident we had a case where we were going to be able to secure a conviction. So Ed Owens walked away a free man. That was a tough pill to swallow because we knew he wasn't innocent. Can we prove it? When the case got dismissed, it wasn't very frustrating. When Ed walked out, I was ticked off, to say the least. However, this wasn't the end for us. We were even more determined that we were going to bring him to justice. Twenty-six years after the murder of Karen Strong, police have arrested their second suspect in the crime, Ed Owens. But prosecutors are forced to drop charges against Ed, leaving Karen's family desperate for justice. After they released Ed Owens, I told Troy, please don't give up, you guys. Come on, there's got to be something. Please don't give up. I made a promise to Coco Salt's giver. We're not giving up on the case. We're not abandoning it. Dismissal without prejudice means it can be refiled. We knew Ed Owens did it. We just wanted to get to the point where we knew we could actually prove it. Detectives re-interview those who knew Karen to find out if she really could have been having an affair with Ed Owens before she was killed. And all the witnesses that I talked to, it was pretty obvious that Steve being as jealous as he was, and also Karen's relationship with Buff, Karen would not be having an affair with Ed Owens. With no evidence of sexual assault found during Karen's autopsy, prosecutors need to establish an alternate theory to Ed's claim of an affair. So why is Ed Owens' a seminal fluid underneath Karen Strom's fingernails? The best theory that we had is Ed Owens went into Karen Strom and Steve Strom's home that night in the summer of 1980 with intent to sexually assault her. That Karen successfully stopped him. I believe that that's probably the best answer because there was no genital injury to our victim, Karen Strom. Yet there's a hell of a struggle. And the way he crushed her neck, it's in anger. He didn't get what he wanted. Prosecutors know they only have one shot at making Ed pay for his crime. And they'll need hard evidence to convince a jury. We can't let him get away with it now again for what he did in 1980. We had to continue to focus in on that crime scene. Now, folks in on Karen's body, go through all the evidence again, looking at every crime scene photo that we had, blowing things up, it's there. We're not going to give up until we find it. Investigators spend weeks examining the evidence in minute detail. 
then they catch something on the underwear Karen was wearing the night she was killed. One of the things that we did notice was there were some very tiny droplets that had never been analyzed. They'd kind of been overlooked. We submitted those to the crime lab. We did not know exactly what it was. When those results came back, another one of these aha moments, that material that was on Karen Strom's panties was Ed Owens' blood. And now we've got this. This was not a consensual sexual encounter. It's the final piece prosecutors are looking for. Ed Owens is picked up and recharged with Karen's murder. When Ed Owens was rearrested, it was a great feeling. Now we felt like our case was ready for prime time. At trial, in front of Karen's family, prosecutors present how the crime unfolded. Ed had gone to the bar, and knowing that Steve was coming into work, slipped out of the bar, and then went to the Strom residence to sexually assault Karen. Struggle ensued. She started lashing out at him. He ended up grabbing her by the throat, killed her, then went back to the bar with his co-workers, uh, using them as an alibi. Sitting through that trial and watching the evidence they had, it was horrific what he did to her. Oh my God, she must have been terrified, but she fought, oh, she fought hard. Who is the best witness against Ed Owens? It's Karen Strong. By the fight she put up and the evidence she gathered, part of what she got out of him when she gouged him was his blood. The defense argues that Ed is innocent and that Steve killed Karen out of jealousy. It seemed like uh, he was very cocky and that he was confident that he was gonna beat this case. The judge let me address him at the trial. I said, you took my sister from me. You took my best friend. You took the person I feel safe with in the world. You took that from me. And he's smiling at me. He was smiling the whole time. After a seven-day trial, the jury takes just nine hours to come to a decision. On April 1st, 2009, the jury returns their verdict. When they said guilty, I just, yes! You know, and then I said, Karen, we did it! Sissy, we did it! We got him! There were a lot of people that waited many, many years for justice with this case. When the jury said guilty, it's a, a sense of relief, a sense of accomplishment, a sense of justice for the victim. Almost 30 years after Karen Strom was killed, Ed Owens is sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole. His first parole hearing will be in 2032. Uh, Ed at that time will be in his upper 80s. Ed will essentially be spending the rest of his life in jail. For Karen's loved ones, Ed may have taken her life, but he can never take Karen from their hearts. I think of Karen all the time. I have a picture of her on my bookshelf, and I know her energy is still there. I can feel it. She was just so kind and so caring. She was a beautiful person, a beautiful soul. You can never be the same again when somebody's ripped out of your life like that, and you have that hole but you can heal from something like this. It is possible. But you fill that hole with life. And you, you hope you live a good life for her too, because she didn't get to. A young woman with a big heart she was the most compassionate, caring, captivating person I've ever met. She was in a very good place in her life. Murdered in a terrifying attack. Somebody set the body on fire and left. Her last few minutes of life was pure hell. Detectives discover a secret affair. They had started to develop more of a relationship. We told him straight up, you're the killer and we're going to have your DNA. Then uncover a surprising suspect hunting for prey. The night that she was murdered, she had answered a call. There was a note. The directions were to a fictitious place. He was trying to trick young women. 
A second tragedy sparks terror in the community. We may be dealing with a serial killer. I lived in fear. I was terrified to go out at night. Before a calculating killer is ultimately revealed. This is not real. This can't be happening. This is crazy. Just 90 minutes from the bright lights of Nashville, Tullahoma, Tennessee is a quaint city full of Southern charm. Tullahoma is a very small town. Everybody knows everybody. Your teachers at the high school are the same teachers that taught your grandparents. The community is very close-knit. The people there are genuine. It's a safe place to live. We don't have a lot of violent, violent crime. In the early morning of July 2nd, 2012, a grisly crime is discovered that sets the whole town on edge. I got the call that a couple of younger people were driving down a very, very rural road and they seen a fire. They were gonna put the fire out, but when they went over there, they noticed that it was a body that was on fire and called 911. When I arrived at the scene, several other investigators were there and said, uh, this is real bad. It appeared that foul play was involved. We weren't sure that she was murdered at this spot. It appeared that somebody may have just pulled over or backed up, dumped the body, set the body on fire, and left. There were some tire tracks. We couldn't plaster cast them because they were in gravel. I just kind of surveyed what we had. There was no evidentiary value where do we go from here? First responders extinguish the fire, and investigators take a closer look at the scene. As we worked our way closer to the body, you started to get a sense of, you know, how horrible this actually was. It's just like something you would see off of a movie. This is not real. This can't be happening. This is crazy. The victim was a young white female, possibly in her 20s. There was star tattoos behind each one of her ears. And there was a magnolia leaf tattoo. I remember she had a shirt on. It had something to do with the nurse and technical school. She was undressed from the waist down. Body was partially burned and covered in soot. The fire was relegated to her pelvic area. It led us to believe that there had been a sexual assault. Someone had obviously tried to burn the evidence up. Her body was already in rigor. I would believe that she was deceased at the time of the fire. What was very glaring was blunt force trauma to her head. You could actually feel the broken bones in the skull. Detectives immediately attempt to identify the young victim. There was no purse, no cell phone no license, no vehicle to help us identify who the victim was. Investigators speak to the couple who made the 911 call. They didn't know who the person was. They didn't see or hear anyone. It was obvious almost immediately. They didn't have anything to do with this homicide. It was very traumatic for them. They just couldn't believe it. At the scene, I made this suggestion to put what information we had on social media to help us identify her. Within a few short hours, local mother of four, Kelly Sharpton, sees the missing persons report posted online. Mom was at work, and there was a post about a young girl that had been found when she came across the section that said she had star tattoos. I was told that mom screamed out in the middle of her office. And then, of course, she called the sheriff's office. She introduced herself, and we started talking, and, and the description seemed similar. The, the tattoos seemed to match. Kelly instantly heads down to the police station for a formal interview. When we interviewed Kelly, she was distraught. She was crying, and she identified the body in Todd's office on pictures. The victim was her daughter, Megan Sharpton. I walked in, 
and I immediately heard my mom sobbing. And I can still hear her to this day. She just said, somebody killed her last night. And it took me a second to figure out what she had just said. And then it hit me that she was gone. 24-year-old Megan Sharpton was a bright young woman with a big heart. She was genuine. She was the most compassionate, caring, captivating person I've ever met. She and I were really, really, really close. She had the best laugh. She was so fun. I could count on Megan to do anything for me. I knew she was always there. She was absolutely hilarious, very bold, and but at the same time, you could tell she didn't want to be the center of attention. Regardless of who you were, where you were from, she didn't care. She really, truly cared for every single person. Megan had decided to turn her caring nature into a career. She was working herself, you know, through nursing school. Megan would have been an amazing nurse. She had her head on straight and was, you know, ready to get going with her career. Along with her calling, Megan had also found love. She lived with her boyfriend, Chris. They were together three to four years. They had the same, you know, group of friends. She was in a very good place in her life. She had lots of goals to go on to those next levels in school, in her career. Megan was about two months away from graduation. She was very excited about it. Never in a million years did I think that somebody would kill her. Investigators start piecing together a timeline of Megan's last known movements. I spoke to her that Sunday afternoon. It was about 4 or 5. We would go to Mom's on Sunday and visit and have dinner and just kind of hang out as a family. But that Sunday was different. Megan said she would be skipping dinner as she had a last-minute job interview. She said that she would head to Mom's at some point. But Megan never showed up. Later on that night, she wasn't there. It wasn't a concern for us. We all thought, OK, well, something else must have come up. She was on her own time, and we'll see her sometime tomorrow. Tragically, it would only be a matter of hours before Megan is discovered dead and on fire. I was very much in shock that day. It didn't sink in that somebody killed her. It was just very, very hard to process. In the interview, Carrie and Megan's mom told us what kind of car she drives. We put a bolo out for that car. When investigators ask who could have been responsible for Megan's death, her sister doesn't hesitate. I said, Chris did it. Megan's boyfriend. And that is the only thing that made any sense to me. He asked me, why do you think Chris did it? I thought, Chris and Megan had a up and down relationship. They were like oil and water. They would be hot headed and tempered at times. Majority of the time that a, a female's killed in the United States is someone that knew. As quick as we could, we want to talk to him. He is a very hot suspect. Coming up, police learn Megan's love life is more complicated than it first appears. Another person had actually been in a relationship with Megan. Did a dangerous love triangle lead to Megan's death? When someone is murdered like that, it's got to be a jilted lover. She had intended to leave him. That would be an absolute motive for murder. Just when detectives believe they have an airtight case, a new piece of evidence changes everything. I saw the video surveillance of that person. It caught my attention big time. Never would I have thought it would wind up like this. Detectives investigating the vicious murder of 24-year-old Megan Sharpton in Tullahoma, Tennessee, 
have their first suspect, her 25-year-old boyfriend, Chris Farrell. Chris and Megan, to me, had an off-and-on relationship. They were both very hot-headed at times. And there were bumps in their relationship. Once Megan and Chris got together, they were inseparable. But towards the end of Megan's life, the relationship had started growing apart at that point. As far as Chris is concerned, it was just the only person that was with her on a daily basis. That was the only thing that made sense. As detectives prepare to bring in Chris for questioning, a fresh lead comes in. The Bedford County Sheriff's Office had located her car. So I had picked up and rushed to where the car was found at. The car was sitting on out in a rural area between Tallahoma and Shelbyville, Tennessee approximately 15 to 20 miles away from the crime scene where Megan was found. This is an odd place, odd way to leave a car. The car was, you know, that of any young person's. It was cluttery, but uh, there was none of her personal effects. Investigators do find one item that grabs their attention. There was a note in the vehicle in a girl's handwriting about where Megan was going. It was directions on how to get to an address. The next thing was to find this address, but there was no address that, that fit the note. The directions were to a fictitious place. In talking to her mother, I learned that she had left to go to this job. Was this the directions that she was given? Did someone lure her here with the intention of doing harm to her? The way this thing was shaping up is that she was abducted where her car was found. She was killed somewhere else and was found on uh, AWALT Road. We just sealed that car off and sent it on to the crime lab for DNA testing. Investigators then head to Megan's apartment to talk to her boyfriend, Chris. The boyfriend was the first person we looked at. He was distraught. On the night of the murder, Chris had told us that he had left for work and she had told him before he left. She had accepted a job by phone that a girl she had went to school with recommended her for this job and that uh, she would return in the morning. And in fact, she didn't return. And he became worried and he had reached out to her mother. Following up on what Megan's sister Carrie had told them, detectives asked Chris if he and Megan had been having any problems. Chris described him and Megan's relationship as a good relationship, that they had their ups and downs like anybody else, but that he would never hurt Megan. Detectives are suspicious he might be hiding something. Why else would Megan's sister point the finger at him so readily? They asked Chris to come down to the station for further questioning. We interviewed Chris, and he was visibly shaken when pressed about his relationship with Megan. Chris changes his story. He was quite honest. He said, you know, that they didn't have the, the best relationship, that, you know, it had been somewhat strained. He felt like that maybe she wanted him to have a better job or maybe be more career orientated. Megan was getting ready to graduate college and start her career. And I don't think Chris was there at that point in his life. He was still, you know, wanted to be young. Chris swears he had nothing to do with Megan's death. Chris's alibi was that he was at work at a local department store where the majority of the night he's going to be on or near some sort of camera. Chris tells police he left for work at 5 p.m. and was there past midnight. But until his alibi can be confirmed and Megan's time of death is determined, he remains on the suspect list. From my interview with Chris, I learned that there was another person that lived in the house, Robbie Rosar. Robbie was one of Chris's friends. He moved in there at the end. My first thought was Robbie hurt Megan that I'd never met in my life, that I know, you know nothing about other than what Megan told me. He was a little rough around the edges, but Megan loved everyone. I reached out that day and I asked him to come in. Robbie was a different person. Robbie was a little darker, a little less happy person. Investigators ask Robbie point blank where he was when Megan was murdered. 
Robbie didn't have an alibi. Robbie showed us he had been texting her all night, even, even in the morning, worried about her. He said, look, I'm not the killer. I want y'all to find out who killed Megan. And he was very, very adamant. He wanted to prove his innocence, which was a good indication for me that he didn't do this. But when detectives ask Robbie about the nature of their relationship, his answer leaves them stunned. Robbie told me that he had actually been in a relationship with Megan, that they were, in fact, lovers, and that she had intended to leave Chris. It was a shocker. Megan had told me a few weeks before her murder that her and Robbie had started to develop more of a relationship versus just friends. When Chris knew about Robbie, that would be an absolute motive for murder. And so, uh, again, that's when we thought, did Chris do this, you know? If things got crazy and tensions got high and emotions ran high, this would be a motive for homicide. A day after 24-year-old Megan Sharpton was violently killed, detectives suspect jealousy could have motivated her murder. Megan was having an affair, but did her boyfriend Chris know? When someone is murdered like that, you always think it's got to be someone close to her. It's got to be like a jilted lover. We brought Chris back in the interview room after speaking with Robbie, and we kind of dropped that bombshell on him just to see his reaction. It turns out Chris did not know about the relationship. Chris was upset. He was visibly upset when he found out that Megan had had relations with Rob, but he maintained that he still loved her and that he'd never hurt her. Chris was sincere, and I believe that was true. Both of them individually took polygraphs. The questions asked were very pointed, you know. Did you cause Megan's death? They were very straight up. They both passed. When Chris and Rob's polygraph came in, it moved them down on the list of suspects. You can't really take them off the list of suspects. They're just simply too close to the victim. But it did move them down. Putting Chris and Robbie on the back burner, detectives turned to the job offer Megan received the night she was killed. Could that have been connected to her death? After the polygraph, I start mulling over Chris's interview and the original nuggets that he had given me about the job. He had told us that, that he thought that it had come in from a girl she had went to school with previously. He had said that I only remember her name is Naomi. Investigators search through school records and discover Megan had a classmate named Naomi Jones. Finding her to talk to her about the possibility that she recommended this job to Megan was going to be very important. Had this job possibly led to her death? I went to Naomi's residence. I knocked on the door. Nobody there. I drug out my lawn chair, and I sat in the front, and I'm going to wait. I'm going to get this statement today. The neighbor kept looking over there like, who is this crazy guy? And I was like, you know, I need to talk to Naomi Jones. He knew the Joneses well enough to have called her. When talking to Naomi, I said, hey, you know, I'm Todd Hyman. I'm with the Franklin County Sheriff's Office. I'm investigating the death of, of Megan Sharpton. Naomi stated that, you know, she knew Megan. They weren't close. She had went to school with the year before in nursing school. I learned that they um, rode to clinicals maybe once together, and she offered up the fact that her husband had drove them. Further talking to her, I learned that she didn't really like Megan for whatever reason. She was very to the point and said, you know, I, would, I wouldn't recommend that girl for anything. Naomi says she has no knowledge of Megan's job offer or her death. While investigators consider their next move, the autopsy report comes in, and it contains a surprising detail. The cause of death was a gunshot wound to the face and blunt force trauma. She was burned, so the soot had kind of hid the wound. Megan was shot with the medical examiner's office believes to be a 22 caliber round. Her skull was broken in several pieces. It's very possible she was hit with a pistol and 
shot with a pistol. The autopsy revealed she was deceased at the time of the fire. She was purposefully burned in an attempt to hide evidence. The autopsy indicates the fire was set shortly before Megan's body was discovered at 1.18 a.m. on July 2nd. Her time of death was likely before midnight. Her last moments alive were pretty terrifying. The report also confirms what police suspected at the scene. The doctor that performed the autopsy said that there was a presence of sexual assault. There was DNA present. I started feeling like there could be a resolution more quickly with that piece of evidence. The DNA is rushed to the crime lab for analysis. Then, two days after Megan's death, detectives get another possible lead. July the 4th, there was a guy in the creek fishing who found Megan's purse along with her driver's license and social security card. We never did find her cell phone. Megan's cell is still missing, but investigators order her phone records, hoping they might point to her killer. As the days start to pass by, Megan's family becomes anxious for answers. 10 days after they found her body, we decided to raise a reward for any information leading to the killer of Meg's case. Many in town begin to wonder if Megan's murder is connected to another high-profile investigation. It was the same time frame as the Holly Bobo case that was going on. It was a whodunit, just as ours. It was in uh, Darden, Tennessee, which wasn't too far from here. And, you know, immediately some citizens would ask me, do you think there's any connection? As detectives compare both cases, they have a chilling realization. Holly Bobo was a nursing student also. She was abducted from her home. I don't believe her body had been recovered. We obviously had to look at the parallels. Was it a nursing student serial killer? It's another lady and it's somewhere to go. You've got a killer running around. Who is he going to kill next? Two weeks after Megan Sharpton was murdered, investigators are searching for a link to the unsolved disappearance of another nursing student in a nearby town a year earlier. The Holly Bobo case became of uh, interest to us, and our investigators reached out to theirs. There was concern that we may be dealing with a serial killer. While detectives from both cases work together to establish a link, rumors sweep through the community. I was terrified to go out at night. I didn't like going places I wasn't familiar with, and I lived in fear almost of just everyone. With Megan's killer still at large, the sense of loss begins to overwhelm her family. I was really hoping that it would be solved pretty quickly because it was consuming mom minute by minute. I could feel her emptiness when Megan passed away. She was never the same again. It absolutely became a mission. I know if it had been my child, I would want somebody to have went that extra mile, to work that extra hour, to find the resolution to, to what had happened. Finally, three weeks into the investigation, police get the results from the forensic search of Megan's vehicle. It came back with no evidence. They didn't find anything that shouldn't have been there. There was nothing of value found. Detectives hope tests on the DNA found inside Megan's body will yield better results. Her approximate time of death was before midnight, so investigators circle back to her boyfriend's alibi. And he said he was working at the time that that happened. Chris was working as a cashier on the evening shift. We go back and pull the video. He was in the store when Megan had been killed. This is not our guy. Chris contacts police with a lead that sends the investigation in a new direction. The original phone call about this job opportunity came in to an older phone that Megan had. Chris is able to locate the phone and shows it to detectives. 
He was able to go back and find a number that he believed had called proposing this job. When investigators run the phone number, they get a surprising result. It was what we refer to as a burner phone. The burner phone, the fake address, and the suspicious job opportunity all add up to what detectives suspected early on. She was going to a fake job interview. So if we could track that phone down, we could get to very possibly who the perpetrator was. Because burner phones don't require a registered name, the number doesn't lead to anyone. So I was able to at least track the phone to being sold at the department store here. And I called their loss prevention person. I was like, well, can you pull every one of these sales that was done? There was like 11 or 12 burner phones purchased, and we pulled video. We started looking at the mails and the questionable ones, and uh, just, you know, who looks like the most suspect person in these pictures? One of the people paid for their phone, that burner phone, but they had their cell phone out on the camera. And just the demeanor and, and, and that just really caught Todd's attention. It caught my attention big time. He's already got a cell phone. He's buying this burner phone for a reason. We were able to use the, the video from the department store to follow him from the purchase, out the door, into the parking lot, almost off camera. We saw him approach a red pickup truck. Why would you park that far out unless you were trying to avoid detection? I take the pictures of this guy and I circulate it at other departments. Within minutes, I had an identification of who this was. This guy's name was Timothy Gifford. Timmy Gifford is a local drug dealer, not the most honest person around. I put the word out that I need to find Mr. Gifford. I felt like he was our guy or he was involved. Officers soon track Timmy down and bring him to the station. We sent him down the interview room. I show him, you know, the picture of him buying the phone. We told him straight up, you're the killer and we're going to have your DNA. And Timmy was, you know, he was stressed out. He was like, you know, I'll tell you everything I know. I didn't do this. Um, it wasn't me. Timmy says he doesn't know Megan and denies speaking to her. When challenged about the burner phone, he tells police he bought it a month before the murder for someone else. He's like, uh, Donnie Jones. I was like, you got to be kidding. Donnie Jones was a police informant. Donnie had been a bad boy for a long time. He had a very long rap sheet, thefts and drugs. Donnie Jones had served time before, and he had been accused of rape before. That right there was a real turn in investigation. At first, detectives struggled to see how someone like Donnie could even be connected to Megan. We find out that Donnie was married to Naomi Jones. That was another nugget that was very interesting. Detectives had already talked to Naomi earlier in the investigation. She told police she did know Megan, but she had never recommended her for a job. Naomi was somebody that Megan went to school with. They would carpool with each other occasionally. And we found out that Naomi's husband, Donnie Jones, would drive them if the weather was bad. Naomi's connected to a male with a criminal history, and he knew Megan Sharpton. There was a lot of aha moments in this case, but that was, we're going somewhere. We, we've got something here. Three weeks after the murder of Megan Sharpton, detectives are interviewing Timmy Gifford. He tells police he bought the burner phone for Donnie Jones and divulges important details about the red truck seen in the surveillance footage. Timmy Gifford said that the truck was Donnie's and that a few days after the murder, he had replaced all the interior. And I was like, ooh, that's probably my murder vehicle right there. The carpet has been replaced. It's been completely detailed. That is a clue that you may be on the right track. Timmy also tells police Donnie traded the truck to his brother a week after the murder. 
Everything is pointing towards Donnie Jones. As quick as we could, we got the search warrant, and we took the truck directly to the TBI crime lab. Investigators. Donnie is adamant he had nothing to do with Megan's death. His alibi was he was home with the kids. I'm with my kids all the time. That's all I can do. And I got a nine month old and seven year old twin. Without something concrete showing that he was home, his alibi didn't hold water. He could have left with the children, he could have left the children with somebody. Detectives confront Donnie with Timmy's claims. This guy said he gave you this phone, and this is the number, the last number to call her when she was alive. He said he gave a phone to me? Yeah. He ain't gave me no phone. I, mean, I, I have nothing to hide. Y'all ain't in my house. Y'all can do it now. We searched the house. We didn't come up with a lot of evidence. There was very little to be found. Donnie also consents to provide a DNA sample. While they wait on the results, detectives get the forensics back on the red truck. The truck had been cleaned, almost sanitized. Even the interior parts that I gathered off the search warrant, they didn't come back with any evidentiary value. Megan's family is briefed on the new developments. I saw the video surveillance of that person purchasing the burner cell phone. I saw somebody that none of us knew that had no association to Megan whatsoever. Todd had a name of the person who that burner cell phone was purchased for. And I just kind of shrugged my shoulders like, OK, who is this guy? Nothing made any sense to me. Four weeks after Megan's murder, the crime lab sends investigators the results of the analysis on the DNA from Megan's autopsy. We got a DNA hit. And the hit come back, and it's Donnie Frank Jones. A supervisor of mine called Donnie up, and he's like, hey, you know, I need to meet with you. Donnie comes down to the station where detectives confront him. I said, did you and Megan Sharpton ever date? No. Did you and Megan Sharpton ever, ever just hook up, one night stand, party or something? No. Well, you and Megan Sharpton during this date, you know, the date of the homicide? No. And then uh, Todd asked, you know, why would your DNA be inside of her? And it was just, his face went, I just couldn't believe it. He got very, very, very irate, mad. After he had a moment, Donnie said, I just had sex with her. However, his initial statement of he had never been around her other than at one time kind of put him in a, in a corner. Detectives don't buy Donnie's story, but they'll need something more concrete to press charges. All we can prove right now is he had sex with her. That was a concern of the district attorney is that, you know, a consensual relationship could have left that evidence behind. Investigators have no choice but to let Donnie go. It was really frustrating for me. I was in complete disbelief. It was infuriating that he said it was consensual. And so he was allowed to walk free as they put the pieces together. Hoping to prove who was with Megan when she was murdered, detectives run a detailed search on four phones, Megan's, Donnie's, Timmy's, and the burner. We asked for cell phone GPS analysis. They can take some technical data and plot it out on a map and show you to some certainty an area where a phone call was made. We're in kind of a waiting pattern 
hoping for phone records for the Silver Bullet to kind of put this thing away. The cell phone analysis will take weeks, but investigators get a chance to get Donnie off the streets when they discover a rifle in the trunk of his car. Donnie's a convicted felon. A convicted felon cannot possess firearms. Even though the rifle is determined not to be the murder weapon, it's enough to arrest Donnie. Now detectives must establish if he killed Megan Sharpton. We got him in custody. We had the DNA, but at the same time, we needed more. We needed as much as we possibly could get. It's all theoretical until you can prove he murdered her. Four months after Megan's murder, investigators receive the detailed phone data and find a clear link between Megan and her killer. And I was just ecstatic. It's hell yeah. I met with Kelly, and I told her in person, I know who killed your daughter. Four months after the savage murder of Megan Sharpton, detectives have used cell phone GPS data to prove who killed the 24-year-old nursing student. That's Donnie Jones. On the night of the murder, the burner phone, I will refer to it as the murder phone, and Donnie's phone, they were in or about the same location. Timmy's phone is not involved. The murder phone and Megan's phone are talking to one another. And the cell phone records will show they were coming in contact with one another, and then they both stopped where her car was found. And I think at that time is when she was abducted. Using the, the cell phone data, we was able to show that at first that Donnie was close to the place where we believe she was abducted at. Then that he was close to the place I believe that he killed her at, and then that he was close to where the body was found. Donnie's family owned several farms in that area, and that's where we felt like that she was murdered. They gave us permission to search that area, and it's an extremely secluded place. Investigators make a telling discovery. There was a burn barrel there that caught my eye. I found a purple scarf with black stars on it. It was later identified by her sister, Carrie, as a gift that she had given Megan. I went from an absolute who done it to this guy might have done it to, oh, this guy definitely done it. The overwhelming evidence is what made the DA take that step to indict him. I was elated. I went to the Coffee County Sheriff's Department and had him brought up, and, and I arrested him. On November 5th, 2012, Donnie Jones is charged with first-degree murder, rape, and two counts of aggravated kidnapping. One attorney, that was it. He had no more to say. Never would I have thought it would wind up like this. When Donnie was charged, Mom, um, she was still pretty overwhelmed, but it was a relief to start learning that we were going to get the details of what events led up to that day. Based on the evidence collected, investigators pieced together how Donnie lured and then murdered Megan. It paints a disturbing picture of a calculating predator. So while looking into the murder phone, we started backtracking all the numbers that it had called, and there was a pattern. Everyone that was called with that phone was someone that was sitting with the elderly or doing some kind of nursing in-home service. The murder phone was used just seeking out a victim. Donnie reached out to Megan. He knew well enough to go in his wife's phone and get her number out, and that's how all this started. She had known Donnie and his wife. They're not close friends, but knew them. She answered that call from Donnie. Megan was on her way to a job that didn't exist. The directions she had got were not good. She had to call our suspect. He met her, at which time 
he abducted her and went back to one of the family's farms. Megan Sharpson's last few minutes of life was pure hell and panic and fear. He raped her and shot her. Megan was beaten prior to being killed. He moved her from there to where he set her body on fire to try to hide his crimes. And then he went home and acted like nothing happened. Donnie Jones is just a cold-blooded killer, sexual deviant, cold-blooded killer. Seven months after Megan's murder, Donnie Jones pleads guilty. And on February 4th, 2013, he's sentenced to life without parole. I feel like there will never be enough done to him. He's sick. He's a monster. There is no reasonable explanation why he did it. There was a sense of accomplishment that we'd moved so fast in finding out who killed her. Had we not have caught him, he would have reoffended. Detectives do determine Megan's murder was not connected to the Holly Bobo case. There was four people arrested in the Holly Bobo case. It had nothing to do with, with my case. If Megan hadn't lost her life, I feel very confident that Donnie Jones would still be out trying to trick young women. Megan put him behind bars for life. She sacrificed her life to keep everybody else in our community safe. Despite getting justice for Megan, the Sharpton family suffers another tragedy just nine months later in November 2013. Mom took her life 16 months after Megan's death. Her heart was just incredibly broken, and she made the choice she wanted to be with Megan. Yeah, he essentially killed them both. Sure did. Our family time, that's when I missed her the most. I missed that laugh. If you just heard Meg's laugh, you would be having a much better day. I miss those specific moments, those milestones that she's not going to get to be a part of. I thought Megan and I would be friends for, you know, on into adulthood. We were supposed to be together forever as best friends, as sidekicks. She was not someone you could forget. There was a memorial placed on the side of the road where she was found, and it's this beautiful giant star sculpture. It's very cool, and Megan would absolutely love it. A gregarious young man, just months away from his wedding day. He was always happy. All he wanted in life was to have a family, work hard, and fall in love. Has his future viciously ripped away? It was evident the young man had been bludgeoned. It hurt me so much, and I lost it. I lost it. Investigators are sent down a rabbit hole of suspects. He was violently jealous. He's a significant drug dealer. It looked like that he may have been kidnapped. They were accompanying a very scared-looking Hispanic young man. Before a shocking revelation. What he was describing was more like something off of a TV show. Turns the case on its head. What he did to us changed our life forever. It was a shock to all of us. It came as an absolute surprise. He had no remorse, he had no guilt. He's a monster. Cornelius, a small town in northern Oregon, nestled among picturesque orchards. Cornelius is a longtime farming community. It's a very kind of nice, sort of sleepy place. It's kind of a little bedroom community. It's mostly a blue collar town, working class. The calm of Cornelius is shaken one quiet morning with the reported disappearance of 20 year old Gonzalo Pisano Guzman. That morning, my mom saw that Gonzalo's bed was made, like no one slept there. So she obviously got all concerned. He didn't come home last night. And then my mom tells me to go to the police station with Sol to report him missing. His fiance, Sol, 
and his sister, Juana, had been actively looking for him that day. That morning, the family contacted his place of employment. He had not shown up for work. The family was extremely distraught by this disappearance. He doesn't miss work without calling in. They couldn't reach him by pager or by telephone. And we're all freaking out because this is not who he is and what he does. It's so odd, it's not normal. We learned that Saul had seen Gonzalo the night before. They had visited with each other until about quarter after nine that evening, and Saul reported seeing him leaving in his car alone, headed home. But he did not return home last night. To aid the detectives, Saul provides a description of what Gonzalo was wearing when she last saw him. He had on an athletic top with some numbers on it, and specifically uh, two gold chains. While Juana and Saul speak with police, other family members frantically look for Gonzalo. We all went different ways in our cars, driving around just to see if we found his car. We were trying to look for anything. My dad thought, you know, maybe he got in an accident. We were desperate. We just wanted a clue. Around four or five o'clock in the afternoon, we all started feeling like, okay, something's wrong now. On the outskirts of town, Gonzalo's father makes a disturbing discovery. My dad spotted the car in an empty field. When he saw the car, the white car, the, he knew right away that was Gonzalo's car. He found the car burned up. He rushed to the car, opened up the car, and didn't find any body. So once that happened, it was just nuts. Where is he at? Did he get kidnapped? Is he dead? It was even worse. Detectives arrive and search for signs of what happened to Gonzalo. The car was uh, totally destroyed by fire. It appeared that the car had been heavily doused with accelerant, probably gasoline. Somebody was clearly trying to cover up evidence from inside that vehicle. There was no evidence of any body. There were zip ties found near the car. As far as the scene was concerned, it yielded minimal clues. As the car had been burned completely, uh, the chances of DNA or blood or fingerprints uh, were greatly reduced. Later that afternoon, another chilling discovery is made, just 11 miles away. A citizen had seen something that looked like a dead body in the ditch on her road. The body was found about a 15, 20 minute drive from where the burned car was. This young man matched both the physical description, the clothing, and the jewelry. At this point, there was no doubt that this was Gonzalo. It was clearly a homicide. Uh, there was evidence of bullet wounds on the body and what appeared to be repeated knife blows to the heart. We also discovered some injuries to the back of the head and it was evident the young man had been bludgeoned. It was apparent that he uh, died a violent death. We felt almost immediately that this was very personal in nature. There was no phone and there was no wallet at the scene, but he still had his jewelry with him, which were gold. So the thought of this being a robbery was off the table pretty quickly. There was another motive here. There were zip ties found near the body, and they matched the zip ties from the scene of the car. One of the things that went through my head was had someone brought zip ties to restrain Gonzalo. We also located four spent casings from a 40 caliber semi-automatic pistol. After finishing up at the crime scene, police are faced with the difficult task of delivering the devastating news to Gonzalo's family. When the police came early in the morning. I opened the door and they told me, we found your brother, uh, but unfortunately he's dead. I was in shock. I heard my mom screaming. It was something I never want to hear again. It's, it's not even a scream. It's a pain so deep that only moms, only moms know what that is. 
I found out that he, he was murdered. And I lost it. I lost it. Era gritar, llora. Algo tan fuerte que todavía de mi mente no se ha acabado. To know that such an amazing person was taken away. He didn't deserve to die that way. Bottom line is, I don't have my brother anymore. Born in Mexico in 1979, Gonzalo had a playful spirit. He loved to dance, he loved music. Always a smile, always caring, and always joking around with people. Gonzalo era un muchacho alegre, y llegaba, me abrazaba, y, y siempre quería bailar conmigo. When the family moved to the United States in 1989, outgoing Gonzalo settled in quickly. He was very charming, he was really good looking, he was popular with the girls. So he was always asked to be in quinceañeras, which is a traditional, you know, uh, party for us Mexicans when you turn 15. In 1998, Gonzalo met Marisol Mora at a party, and the teenagers quickly fell in love. De que estaba muy enamorado de, de Marisol. Marisol era el amor de su vida de Gonzalo. Era, era todo para él. Todo. It was that genuine love and happiness. There was a light in him. He was a completely different person, a happy, full person. And all he wanted in life was to have a family, work hard, and fall in love. After a whirlwind romance, Gonzalo proposed to Marisol. So the wedding was set to be in September. That was just a couple of months after he was murdered. We have a big family, so it was going to be a big deal. But instead of a wedding, Gonzalo's loved ones are left heartbroken and grieving. While his family plans a funeral, detectives are digging into the work of this homicide case. This case was puzzling. There really didn't seem to be a strong motive as to why this young man was murdered. Everything was going good in his life. He was responsible. He wasn't involved in gangs. He's just very well-liked, very upbeat, and just a trustworthy young man. It was really difficult. There were still so many unanswered questions, and we had no definitive leads as to who would have caused this or who we were looking for. The fact that there was still a killer out there, to me, it was very ominous. This is very grim. We needed to really look into who was responsible for this. Coming up. Investigators uncover a menacing grudge. He held an extreme dislike for Gonzalo. He was determined to have Gonzalo killed. The knife wounds directed at the heart did speak of extreme animosity. And leads them to discover a web of alarming secrets and lies. She wasn't in love with Gonzalo and he wasn't in love with her. She admitted it was all a lie. He saw skinheads in the vehicle. And that's when we really started to think something was wrong. Before the truth blindsides everyone. I was like in shock. It was so senseless. It was so senseless. In the town of Cornelius, Oregon, police are investigating the vicious murder of 20-year-old Gonzalo Pisano Guzman. Wanting more details about his last known movements, detectives speak to his fiance, Saul. She described in detail how Gonzalo had come to her house on the night of the 6th, that they sat out front on the porch. They were discussing their plans for the upcoming wedding and going over a guest list. She stated that following the conversation that he left around 9 o'clock. She stated while they were sitting on the porch that her cousin Jaime and a friend Eddie were playing in the, in the garage of the house, uh, apparently uh, shooting baskets. That led us to believe that these two young fellows may have been the last known persons to see Gonzalo alive. So it was important that we interview them. Investigators bring Jaime and Eddie into the sheriff's office. During the interview, both stated that uh, they had to get to work that night and approached Gonzalo as he was getting in his car and asked if they could get a ride they were running late for work. They worked on a janitorial crew run by Saul's 
brother, Raphael. They had to be at work in Hillsboro at the Hawthorne Farms Fitness Center at 10 o'clock. They said Raphael picked them up and took them to work at the athletic club, and that eventually they got off at about 4.30 in the morning. The fact that they both gave the same statement actually provided themselves an alibi. They did not offer any conflict that they had with Gonzalo. They indicated that they had uh, no reason to, to hurt him. To corroborate Jaime and Eddie's alibi, police speak to their boss, Saul's brother, Rafael. We interviewed him at his house. He was very cooperative, very smooth, very polite, had his own business, a young entrepreneur. Raphael was an incredibly self-possessed 19-year-old. Uh, he had created a janitorial service. Although he was very young, had a very good contract, had his own cleaning company, and appeared to be very successful. Detectives ask him to confirm Jaime and Eddie's story. He confirmed that he had picked them up at Eddie's house and drove them to work. He confirmed their story that they had worked cleaning the health club that night. He said that he was at the athletic club until about four in the morning. So Raphael, in effect, corroborates Eddie and Jaime's version of events on the night of the 6th. So we kind of set them aside. With Jaime and Eddie alibi, investigators turned to the autopsy report, hoping to find new leads. It became very apparent just how violently he had died. The medical examiner did find three blunt force blows uh, to his skull. The autopsy also showed that he had been shot five times. And then he had also been stabbed five times, very brutally, in the area of the heart. The close cluster of the knife wounds directed at the heart did speak of extreme animosity, some violent emotion. The gunshot wounds made it appear that his Hands were up in a defensive gesture. Gonzalo was likely pleading for some measure of mercy, and uh, ultimately, none was to be had. The autopsy report also determines that Gonzalo's death occurred around 10 p.m. With the findings in hand, investigators now turn to Gonzalo's workplace, searching for possible suspects. We interviewed his supervisor, Gonzalo's boss described him as reliable, steady worker, punctual. As detectives dig deeper, they learn about a startling new side to Gonzalo. It appeared that he had a relationship with one of the security guards that worked there. Gonzalo's boss did tell us there may have been some possible involvement between the security guard, Bobette, and Gonzalo. So we needed to look into it. We needed to interview her. Police bring Bobette, Gonzalo's alleged girlfriend, in for questioning. She was very upset about his death. She was very emotional, very distraught about finding out that Gonzalo had been murdered, and ultimately disclosed that, in fact, uh, she had had a very intimate relationship with Gonzalo for a couple months. But she made it very clear she wasn't in love with Gonzalo, and he wasn't in love with her. Bobette described her relationship with Gonzalo as kind of a fling. It was kept secret. She understood that he was engaged to be married, but it crossed our minds that maybe Bobette's feelings were stronger than she let on. Maybe she did not want this wedding to go forward. The wedding was planned for September, only a few months away. Police asked Gonzalo's co-worker about her movements on the day of the murder. Bobette had been at several different locations that day. Uh, running errands, and she had receipts to support that. So she was ruled out as a suspect. But while Bobette's cleared of suspicion, she hands detectives a crucial tip. Bobette mentioned an ex-boyfriend named Oscar Rodriguez. She told us Oscar was quite jealous. He was extraordinarily jealous, apparently had been violently jealous in the past. About four days before the murder, Oscar had found out about her relationship with Gonzalo. He became infuriated and began accusing her of cheating on him. That could be a motive for Gonzalo's murder, so Oscar became a lead suspect.
Only two days into the investigation of the vicious murder of Gonzalo Pisano Guzman, police discover he was involved with his coworker, Bobette. Now she's pointed the finger at her jealous ex, Oscar Rodriguez. She speculated that maybe he had something to do with it. We looked into him. He had a criminal history. He'd been pretty extensively involved in gangs at that point in his life, and he was well known to the local police. Very much an impulsive young man that was also involved in drug activity and drug use. Bobette told us that this was a relationship she had to escape from. She personally felt threatened by his presence and his behavior. And she was very worried that perhaps he was the one that uh, took some action uh, towards Gonzalo. Investigators uncover a troubling detail about Oscar's life. It was discovered that Oscar Rodriguez's mother uh, lived right next door to uh, the victim's family. The investigation kind of perked up as far as focusing in on Oscar, given the fact that he, he had such access to Gonzalo. Detective suspicion grows further when they speak to Oscar himself. When Oscar Rodriguez was interviewed, he lied to us and told us he had not had any contact at all with Bobette and didn't really know anything about what was going on. When we started to confront him that this was in contradiction to the information that we had from Bobette, he became furious, started yelling at us, you don't trust me. He stated he had no claims to continue any relationship with Bobette and uh, he wanted to wash his hands of this entire investigation. Because of his nature, he just drew suspicion upon himself. He was asked if he'd take a polygraph to show that he didn't have anything to do with Gonzalo's murder. He became very volatile and immediately demanded to end the interview. Then actually stormed out of the interview. With Oscar not cooperating, detectives investigate his whereabouts during the time of the murder. During this time frame, Oscar Rodriguez was actually serving a sentence in the Restitution Center. The Restitution Center is a work release facility for low to mid-level offenders, where Oscar could get passes to go out and find work. So the question was, did Oscar have a pass at the date and time of the murder? Was it possible that he wasn't in the Restitution Center? He is on a strict timeline he had to check in, check out. It's a secure facility. The building is locked. There are alarms on all the doors and windows. At the restitution center, there is a lockdown period at night until early in the morning. After the records were examined, it was positively concluded that he was in the restitution center at the time Gonzalo was killed. It was impossible for him to have been involved in the actual homicide and ultimately he was ruled out as a suspect. It's been a week since the murder and the investigation is no closer to finding a suspect. Meanwhile, the family prepares to bury their beloved Gonzalo. It was really hard on everybody. My mom decided she wanted to take him to Mexico. He was buried over there and we all stayed for a while trying to grieve together as a family and process what had just happened to our family. My mom was just devastated. It hurt me so much to lose Gonzalo. I was grieving deeply. I was in denial. I was in my own world. And I don't even know how I got by. While the family grieves in Mexico, the community of Cornelius is feeling on edge. There wasn't a quick arrest within a, you know, a couple days or a week. This caused concern in the community because no one knew who did it. Searching for new leads, detectives turned to the public. We decided to put out a reward for information. And the idea was to get people to come forward if they knew anything and let them know that we're a little bit frustrated with where this investigation is going. We need public help. Nearly two weeks after Gonzalo's murder, police get a tip that sends the investigation in a whole new direction. We got a call from an employee of the uh, SB gas station. His name was Ryan Petty. He claimed that he had seen some graffiti written in the bathroom of the gas station. And the graffiti said, Gonzalo Guzman, 
12th Street gang, please help, call the police. And once he heard about the reward, he put Gonzalo with that name Gonzalo and recognized it must be the same victim who, uh, who had left that, that cry for help on the wall. Detectives rush to the gas station to interview Ryan. While interviewing him, he divulges a shocking revelation. So what called his attention to the bathroom was shortly before he saw a car pull up, a white Monte Carlo, uh, that had, in his words, skinheads in the vehicle. One of them allegedly had a swastika tattooed on his body. They were accompanying a very scared-looking Hispanic young man. He stated that it looked like that Gonzalo may have been kidnapped. That was significant in the fact that we felt this was a big break that came in the case. Nearly two weeks after Gonzalo Pisano Guzman was found brutally murdered, a gas station attendant named Ryan Petty has told police he saw Gonzalo with three suspicious men the night he was killed. He described a carload of skinheads that uh, had drove up and a young man in the back seat who appeared frightened and they escorted him into the men's restroom uh, for a short period of time. He said that ultimately out of the bathroom, the Hispanic individual came out and they hustled him back into the car and drove away. So Ryan Petty reported that uh, when he went into the bathroom after the individual left it, he saw written on the wall, Gonzalo Guzman help a 12th Street gang call police. But as detectives dig into Ryan's story, some details don't add up. Had it been Gonzalo who had gone into that bathroom afraid for his life and put his name on the wall, he never would have written his name as Gonzalo Guzman. We knew that was incorrect. He would not sign his name in that nature. That was the maternal name. He would have used the paternal name. Guzman is his mother's name. He would have written his name as Gonzalo Pazano. Pazano is his father's name. And so right away, this was suspicious. And just the whole nature of what he was describing was more like something off of a TV show. The skinheads, the swastika, it just didn't ring true. And so it was suspected that he was trying to come forward for the reward. We looked through the uh, videotape from the SB station during the period of time this employee stated that car had gone by. There was nothing in that videotape that corroborated anything he had told us. No white Monte Carlo. No individuals who could be characterized as skinheads. More importantly, no individual who was a scared Hispanic person being escorted to the bathroom. The examination of the surveillance video at the gas station contradicted Ryan Petty's uh, version of events. And also, one of the issues was he didn't report this right away. When police check Ryan's record, they find more troubling news. He had a pretty checkered past. He was no stranger to the criminal justice system. Some of his arrests were for crimes that would cause you to doubt his honesty. In my mind, we rule it out as pure fabrication. It just was too cute, too stereotypical. The mistake with the Spanish surname, I didn't buy it. With another lead exhausted, investigators face a daunting realization. We reached a point where we were getting nowhere leads weren't panning out. Having no significant suspect is very depressing. Really, if you don't solve these cases early on, the longer they go, the likelihood that you're actually going to be able to solve them um, becomes less and less. In cases like this where we're not getting anywhere, especially on a homicide, we took this very personal. Up to that point, this team had not had an unresolved homicide. The lack of progress also adds to the pain suffered by Gonzalo's family. It was very hard. It was very painful to come back from Mexico and there was no arrest yet. Fue algo fuerte para mí. Mucho dolor. Tenía mucho coraje y mucho odio en mi corazón. Everything was very silent and 
we were getting very, very impatient. My mom was getting very impatient with the detectives and all they told us is to please trust them. So we put our life in their hands. Two more months pass without an arrest. With the case at a standstill, detectives review the entire investigation for something they may have missed. It can be very frustrating when you reach that point where you've kind of hit the wall, but you just have to resolve to redouble your efforts and to keep digging, keep pushing. It was time to go back and look over everybody one more time. We knew that Eddie and Jaime were the last people to see Gonzalo at Saul's house the night of the murder. Even though they'd been interviewed and gave a pretty good account of their activity that night, their boss, Rafael, provided an alibi for them. We wanted to be sure. So at this stage is when we asked them to take uh, a polygraph. But when we began to ask them to take a polygraph, they started dodging and weaving. For some reason, they began to balk, and this threw a red flag as to why they weren't coming forward. Again, these are the last two people to see Gonzalo alive and now they're uh, getting cold feet about taking a polygraph exam. And that's when we really started to think something was wrong. Detectives keep the pressure on Jaime and Eddie. And on September 14th, Eddie comes in for his polygraph. The polygrapher was hooking Eddie up, attaching these leads to him to measure his response. And uh, he doesn't even get to the questions. And Eddie says, okay, I'll tell you what happened. And he immediately makes it clear that he wants to tell everything that happened. In police parlance, he spilled it. Two months after the murder of Gonzalo Pisano Guzman, detectives are re-interviewing witnesses, hoping for a break. Now, Eddie, one of the last people to see Gonzalo alive, has told police he knows more than he's let on. He gave a detailed, recorded statement about what happened on the night of the murder. As he talks to investigators, Eddie drops a bombshell. He disclosed that he had actually been approached by his boss, Rafael, who was Saul's brother, to coordinate delivering Gonzalo to the Forest Hills Country Club parking lot. Eddie told us that it had all been planned out by Raphael. Raphael had enlisted Joe Noble to help with this crime. Joe was Raphael's friend. Eddie went on to tell us that night, he and Jaime lured Gonzalo to drive his car to the golf course. And as they pulled up, Joe Noble appeared with a gun in his hand. And as Eddie and Jaime got out of Gonzalo's car, Noble got into the car, pointing the gun at Gonzalo. And also present in the parking lot was Rafael and his white Ford F-150. Gonzalo was driven away by Rafael and Joe, but Eddie claims he has no idea what happened next. He stated that he and Jaime had left the country club and got into their vehicle, left and went home and went to work as usual. Could the brother of Gonzalo's fiance, Saul, really be behind his brutal murder? It was extremely surprising to suddenly see Rafael Mora as somebody different than this really incredibly self-possessed 19-year-old who started his own business. But according to Eddie, Raphael leads a disturbing double life. Eddie told us that Raphael was a pretty active drug dealer. The nice entrepreneur cover of Raphael was all a lie. He's a significant drug dealer, and it appears orchestrated the kidnapping of Gonzalo with Joe Noble. This completely surprised me. Raphael did appear, at least on the surface, to be legit and now he's just not who we thought he was. It was a shock to all of us. The one thing detectives still need to know is why Raphael would want to kill his future brother-in-law. Up to that point in time, there was nothing to link him. There was, there was no motive that anybody could speak of. Investigators first turned their attention to Joe Noble. 
suspecting he may have been taking orders from Raphael. Joe Noble was uh, known as a small-time criminal. An informant told us he was very concerned about a 40 caliber pistol he had sold to Joe Noble. And he suspected that this may have been the murder weapon used in the killing of Gonzalo. That's not the last of the informant's revelations. He said that Joe Noble had talked to a female at one of the local bars and had asked her to alibi for him on the particular night in question. We contacted her. She told us that, yes, Joe had asked her to say he was with her on the night of the 6th. And most importantly, she said, I wasn't with him. Police bring Joe in for questioning. Joe denied having any involvement whatsoever to the murder. During our interview with Joe, he actually tried to use the alibi. And then when we confronted him with the fact that we'd already talked to her and she said it was all BS, then he stopped talking. Joel stated that he wanted an attorney and didn't want to talk anymore. With nothing concrete to hold Joe, police are forced to release him and turn their attention to Raphael. Investigators learned that Raphael's cleaning business was not all that it was purported to be. He had a contract with the Hawthorne Farms Athletic Club. The manager of the health club was not very impressed with the quality of Raphael's work and the work of his crew. It was really a shoddy operation by all accounts. We considered the fact that the cleaning company may have been a front for Raphael's drug dealing. Raphael told police he was cleaning the gym with Eddie and Jaime the night of Gonzalo's murder. So investigators check with management in order to corroborate his alibi. The manager of the club said he often couldn't reach him. So he had no idea if he was there or not on the night of the murder. With his alibi falling apart, detectives ask Raphael's sister, Saul, why he might want Gonzalo dead. Saul admitted that Raphael had had a serious talk with her and that it was clear that he was opposed to the wedding, felt she was too young. Raphael did not want Gonzalo marrying Saul. Just did not see Gonzalo as being worthy of, of marrying into the family. Investigators learned that Raphael would mock Gonzalo for the car he drove. He'd mock him for bringing over a bottle of wine to his parents that was cheap and, and, and not any good. Raphael held an extreme dislike for Gonzalo. When accompanied by friends, he would go buy Gonzalo's car and talk about keying it or smashing a window out and laughing about it. With the evidence against Raphael stacking up, police are ready to bring him in for an interview. But there's just one setback. He disappeared. At this point, it's become pretty apparent that Raphael has got something to hide. When you put it all together, there was probable cause to arrest him. With a warrant for Raphael's arrest, police initiate a manhunt. He had a girlfriend named Sandy Montez. We found him hiding at his uh, girlfriend's house. He had dyed his hair orange, and it was obvious that he had done it to try to change his identity. On September 28, 2000, Raphael is officially charged with first-degree kidnapping and aggravated murder. I was, like, in shock. I had so much anger at Rafael. It's an anger I can't explain. Just when police believe they have their man, the investigation takes another shocking turn. We had Rafael in custody when uh, his girlfriend showed up with evidence stating that there is no way he could have been at the murder scene. This raised some obvious concerns. Could it be possible that Rafael was not involved in Gonzalo's murder? It came as an absolute surprise. Police have arrested Rafael Mora in the death of his sister's fiance, Gonzalo Pisano Guzman. But now, Rafael's girlfriend, Cindy, claims she has an alibi for him on the night of the murder. Cindy produced a receipt from a 
auto detailing place that uh, purported to have dropped off Raphael's vehicle the night of the murder and that Raphael was there and signed for it. It was presented as a solid piece of evidence that Raphael was working at the athletic club the night in question and they had the receipt to prove it. And an individual named Cassandra, who owned the company, had signed off and was going to be an alibi witness. Checking the validity of the receipt, police interview Cassandra, who admits to being a friend of Raphael. With a little bit of prodding by the investigators, uh, she finally admitted that, in fact, the receipt was fake. She confessed it was all a lie, orchestrated by Raphael. It was something that she dummied up because Raphael uh, had asked her to. With Raphael's alibi discredited, investigators turn up the heat on co-conspirator Joe Noble. He told the officers that he hadn't been completely honest. He admitted that he was at the parking lot at the golf course. He was there when the car was burned. He admits the kidnap. He admits to pistol whipping the victim. He said that it was Raphael ordering him to do that. They then picked up Gonzalo, put him in the back of a Ford uh, white pickup truck. And then Raphael drove Joe home with the victim knocked out in the back of the truck. But when he last saw Gonzalo, Gonzalo, uh, albeit knocked out, was still alive. And then supposedly Raphael would have then driven back out to Hag Lake and killed Gonzalo. Detectives have a hard time believing Joe was not there when Gonzalo was finally killed, but have no proof. We had no physical evidence that we could link them to the crime, and it was frustrating. Desperate, investigators obtain security footage from businesses along the route they believe Raphael and Joe would have taken to and from the murder. Something on one of the tapes grabs their attention. We saw Raphael's pickup pull into the gas station to get gas. And lo and behold, there's Joseph Noble getting out of the white Ford and going into the gas station. And the timing of the gas station surveillance footage indicated that would have been probably shortly after the murder. Police also obtain a warrant for Raphael's phone records. Raphael insisted all along that he couldn't have committed the murder because he was miles away cleaning the gym. And lo and behold, at the time of the murder, his phone was not bouncing off the nearest tower to the athletic club. It was bouncing off the nearest tower to Hag Lake, which puts him in the area of the murder. That was huge. I felt ecstatic because I knew in that moment that we had him, and it absolutely conclusively meant that his alibi at the athletic club was false. This was a big moment of actually having some physical evidence. There's a great deal of satisfaction, too, having found the truth. With the new evidence in hand, prosecutors are confident they can secure a conviction. And in 2003, Joe Noble and Raphael Mora are tried together. Both were charged with uh, aggravated murder and with kidnapping in the first degree. At trial, prosecutors present a picture of what they believe happened to Gonzalo the night he was murdered. Raphael did not want him marrying his sister. Raphael was determined to have Gonzalo killed. And so he hatched a plan to get Gonzalo out to the golf course. Lured Gonzalo out there with Eddie and Jaime. After getting out of the car, Gonzalo was beat and pistol whipped and thrown into the back seat of the pickup. Rafael or Joe then set the car on fire and they proceeded to Hag Lake. They drove to an isolated spot. Gonzalo got out of the car. The gun was pointed at him. We believe that he was shot multiple times by Joe. and that Raphael was the one that wanted to get the final word in and stabbed him multiple times in the heart. On the stand, a witness reveals Raphael bragged to him about the murder. That Gonzalo was begging for his life, that Gonzalo was promising that he would stop the relationship with Saul, that he would move to Mexico, 
mató a mi hijo de esa manera tan cruel. Gonzalo no se merecía esa muerte tan fuerte, nada más para que no se casara con Marisol. No one deserves to be killed that way. No one. It was so senseless. It was so senseless. On April 28, 2003, the jury finds Rafael and Joe guilty of Gonzalo's murder. Joe was sentenced to life with a possibility of parole after 25 years. Rafael was sentenced to straight life, no possibility of parole. After five years in prison, Rafael appeals his conviction, arguing ineffective counsel. The judge decided that this case should go back to trial, which was a shock to all of us. Ultimately, a decision was made to allow Rafael to plead to manslaughter in the first degree. Rafael's sentence is reduced to 25 years and 10 months. With time served, he will be eligible for early release in 2024. He had no remorse, he had no guilt. He's a monster. Because <laughs> what he did to us changed our life forever. He destroyed us. Even after everything they've endured, Gonzalo's family remains inspired by his memory. Yo lloré por muchos años, mucho tiempo, y un día yo lo soñé. Yo estoy bien, mal. No llores por mí. Yo estoy muy bien. Y yo lo miré riéndose y me dijo que ya no llorara por él, que él estaba bien, que él estaba en paz. He was a happy person that wanted everybody around him to have that same joy and made sure that we were always laughing. Those are the moments that I will always cherish the most. Gonzalo was one of the most genuine men that I've known. <laughs>